Welcome to Israel. It's midnight from Jerusalem. We serve a great God, and in a great way, we should praise Him and worship Him. And what that means is this, that we need to follow His instructions. And the more we learn about the tabernacle, the vessels within the tabernacle, how that tabernacle was constructed, and then later on the instructions for the temple, the more we learn about these things, these truths impact our life so that we can worship greatly our great God. Well, as I said, welcome to Israel. It is our weekly live stream event, a collaboration between the Congregation of the Word and loveisrael.org. We're going to begin with a verse of scripture that we read a few weeks ago from the book of Exodus chapter 25 and verse 8. So I would invite you to take out your Bible and to look at these words. It is a blessing for us not just to hear, but to see these words and even say them with me. So Exodus 25 verse 8 where we read, Ve asu li mikdash ve shachanti betocha, which means simply, make for me a holy place, and I will dwell in the midst of them. So God referring to us in a unique way that He wants to dwell with us. Now, as I've said, God is omnipresent. He's always everywhere. But in a unique way, he wants his dwelling presence, that manifestation of his glory, his provision, everything that he wants us to have. We see that it's tied to his presence in a unique way, being with us. And we see that presence being related to, and here's the key for our purposes, it is tied to worship. It is when we worship God properly. Now, a few minutes ago, I said God is great, and He is, and He needs to be worshipped in a great manner. And that means according to His instructions. And here's a very important biblical truth. The more we know about the tabernacle and then later on the temple, the more we learn about its dimensions, how it was made, those things that it consisted of, all the instructions concerning these elements of worship, it is going to impact our ability to worship God, to draw near to Him, to experience His presence, and to receive His provision and His insight so that we can behave in a way that manifests His presence in our life and His glory from our actions. Realize, faith, simply believing in God, is not going to manifest His glory. It's not going to cause you to be a, a testimony that is pleasing to Him. It is only when we act in faith, we behave, we do, then through action, God's glory, His presence is manifested in the life and through the life of a believer. Well, we're going to turn now to the book of Deuteronomy, as we always do, Deuteronomy chapter 6, a foundational passage which in, within Judaism for stating our faith in one God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. From Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 4. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. Baruch Shem Kavod, Machuto Leolam, Vaed. Via Hafta et Adonai Elohecha, Bekole Vavcha, Uvako Napshecha, Uvako Meodecha. Vehayu Hadvarim Haele, Asher Anoki Mitzavcha, Hayom Al. Leva Vecha, 
Veshina netam levanecha, ve de bartem bam, be shiptacha, be vetacha, uf letacha, ve derk, ukshak becha, ukomecha, uksartam le ot a yedecha, ve hayu le totafot ben anecha, uf taftam au mizazot betecha, uvesherecha. And now let us go before our great God in a moment of prayer. God, we, we hallow your name. That is, we sanctify, we proclaim that your name is holy. And indeed, you are greatly to be praised. For you are perfect in all ways. Lord, we come before you tonight humbly, seeking your presence in our life, manifesting your glory, being instruments of your will being doers and not just hearers of your word. Lord, we pray for forgiveness, acknowledging that we still struggle in sin and rebelliousness when we put more of an emphasis on our will rather than canceling out our will so that your will might be made known and that your will can be fulfilled in our life and through our life. Lord, we, we exalt you as your servants. We praise you as your children. And we honor you as the one true God. We give you thanks for sending your only begotten son, Yeshua, into this world. We thank you for his forgiveness, his death upon that tree, the blood that he shed that was his own, so our eternal redemption could be known. We thank you for this eternal hope that will not disappoint. We thank you for assurance that encourages us to walk forward in faith and obedience regardless of opposition. Lord, we pray tonight for, for your will, that your will would be manifested in each person, that they would submit, that they would grow, and in obedience to your word, that they would have a God-pleasing testimony. Lord, we ask that you would be preparing us for what we will encounter, that we will do so in a way that, that brings honor to you, that's a testimony to others, a, a proper witness that others might learn from us. Lord, we truly want to be your vessels, your instruments in this world. So help us, shape us, mold us, form us into to your perfect workmanship, that we are a tool in your hand for your purposes. God, again, we, we give you thanks. We worship you. We bow before you. We, we lift up your holy name, that name which is above all name, that name who is the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings, Messiah, Yeshua. We pray tonight, as always, for those who are in need of healing, for those who are sick, injured, those who are discouraged, full of despair, those who are grieving, those who are sad, those who are, are, are hurting for whatever reason, we pray your, your ministry unto them, that you would lift up your angels, that you would send one of us, that we might be an instrument of deliverance. Father, we thank you that you have indeed equipped us. We thank you for that armor that we, we wage war against the enemy and that you have equipped us for victory. All these things, Lord, we pray in the blessed name of our Lord and Savior, Messiah Yeshua. Amen. In the book of Exodus, we see truth in regard to worship. I've shared with you that God has created all human beings to worship Him. And this first expression of a community worship is given in a location, a portable location called the Mishkan or the Tabernacle. We saw last week and the week prior to that that there were instruments and we're going to encounter others in the weeks to come. But we talked about the Ark of the Covenant, the table of showbread and the showbread itself, and also the menorah. These three instruments stand out. These vessels that speaks of God's presence, 
His provision, His power, all these things that God wants to share with us that the man of God, the woman of God might be complete, that we might be thoroughly prepared to worship Him both in word and deed. And now after instructing us concerning these three elements, again, the Ark of the Covenant, the table with the showbread, and the menorah, that golden lampstand, now we're going to get some general instructions concerning the tabernacle. And it's very important when you hear the term tabernacle for this study, we're not talking about the courtyards, we're not talking about the location where the, the altar was, the Mizbech. We're not talking about the, the surrounding tent that went around it, almost like a fence when we look at it with our eyes today. We're not speaking about any of those things, but the tabernacle in the sense of that, that inner structure. When you come into the general area, You'll see courtyards, and then as you move forward from the outer court into the inner court where that altar was, and then pass fuller into this structure. So it's the structure that we're speaking about, which comprise two compartments, as we'll see as we conclude this evening, the holy place and the most holy place. So this is what... God's word is revealing tonight. These two places, the holy place and the most holy place. This structure known as, in a very technical sense, the Mishkan. Now, many people simply look at this from a general perspective. And in doing so, believe it or not, they make very specific uh, uh, statements about this but when you look at this you'll find that in many ways it's hard to understand to grasp all these instructions we might understand the words but in order to carry out these words and exactly how to construct the tabernacle is a matter of great debate and that's why when you look at this section of scripture and you look at the various commentators that spoke concerning it, there are a variety of different opinions. And that's why if there's someone that says, oh, this means this perfectly, I understand this, this is how it was, and everything, you have very specific and exact understanding to these things. That person is, is oversimplifying, and he's making statements that really, he does not understand. This passage of scripture is difficult. It's hard to grasp all the intent of it. And that's why those who say, let's just build the third temple. Again, we're speaking about a tabernacle. It's different from the temple. Much similarities, same vessels inside, but one was portable. One was a structure that was put down put up and taken down while the temple was more of a permanent structure that did not go from one place to another, but remained there on Har Habai, the Temple Mount. So we need to be clear about what we're speaking of. Now, my hope is in this next 30 or 40 minutes that we can rapidly but properly go through this 26th chapter. So my encouragement to you is to, to get a pen and paper in hand so that you can jot down some things and make fuller studies concerning this. But let's begin a, a quick study going through this 26th chapter of the book of Exodus. We're going to take it very literally, but quickly. Verse 1. And the Mishkan, this is this word, tabernacle. So it says, and the tabernacle. Now I realize that, that many English translations add things to it to make kind of a nice construction of this first, 
verse, but it comes abruptly. The first word is and, and then it's attached to a, a particle of speech that cannot be translated, but simply points out the, the direct object. So the subject here, the emphasis of what we're speaking about, the subject in the sense of the main idea, but not subject in a grammatical sense. We simply read, and the tabernacle you shall make. So the subject is you, the verb is make, and the direct object is the tabernacle. But the tabernacle, its phrase comes first, which is odd. Not normally the grammatical pattern, but this is to emphasize that the emphasis of this section is indeed the tabernacle. So the word order, the construction grammatically, gives us a lot of information. And the tabernacle, you shall make, once more it's in the singular. We have different views of why. One, and I've mentioned this before, it's to speak to Moses that he's responsible. Not that he's going to do all the work and the construction himself. We'll see that this is not the case later on. But that he is responsible. The second interpretation, it doesn't have to be either or, both can be correct. And that is the singular, when it says you shall make singular, it speaks about all of our responsibilities. We all have a role in this. And that's going to be seen with the contribution that people make for the material that's necessary for this, this tabernacle. So it involves all of those who want to worship God. Once more, verse 1. And the tabernacle you shall make. And the first piece of, of material, the structure for it, it says here, 10 curtains. Now, I think it's very important that it begins with the number 10. 10 is a number of completion or wholeness. Don't believe those who say seven is a number of completion. It's not. Seven is a number of holiness or sanctification. So there's a complete sense. The tabernacle is going to give the children of Israel, in a very holistic sense, the proper means to worship God. Now, is it the, the conclusion of worship? No. We all know the verse, and I've said it frequently over the last few weeks. Messiah said, there is a time coming, and now is, of course, in his days, when God will require from humanity that, that we worship him in spirit and truth. That is the full sense, the complete sense of worship, spirit and truth, but in this time allotment, based upon the wilderness constraints, this gives them the complete instructions for that period, that people, and that spiritual condition to worship God. So we begin with the ten curtains, and notice it says that, that they are made of a twisted linen. Now, the word here is shesh. Shesh is a fabric. And the next word, mashzar, is a, a fabric that is twisted. It's made in some way. There's great debate on what that literally means, how this fabric is constructed. No one knows with, with certainty today. And these curtains are of techelet. This is that blue or turquoise material. Also, argaman, this is kind of a royal purple, purple, and also crimson. So there's a debate. Some say of the authorities that it is a twisted linen that comprises of techelet, argaman, and also tolat, shini. These three Tachelet is turquoise, a blue, argaman, a royal purple, and then finally a, a crimson color. 
Others will say that it's twisted into three separate uh, layers, that these are three separate curtains that form one. So there's debate about it. But what is interesting is that we also have the kruvim, these cherubim, these images of angels, the same word for the Ark of the Covenant on that covering. We'll come to that towards the end of our study tonight, that we're on both sides of the kapoor, that mercy seat. So we're going to have them somehow or other. Notice it says, Maaseh Choshev. Maaseh is work. Choshev is thinking. So we put those cherubim some way, a thinking way. Some say that Maaseh Choshev is a woven or to be weaved into it somehow. We don't know. But the images of the cherubim should be on them Thus you shall do them. So right off the bat, the first verse, there's many things that's hard to understand. So we have these three materials. The number three is important. It relates to revelation. And some say we have four. Four relates to the world. It's a global number. And notice what happens when we keep reading. It says, The length, verse 2, the length of one curtain is 28 cubits, and the width is 4 cubits. Now, I'm not going to probably go over all the numbers, but 28 is normally comprised when we think of it in our mind as 4 times 7 or 7 times 4. The order's not important. 4, as I said, is a global number, and the number 7 has to do with holiness or sanctification and when the sages see this the first thing they want to say is this that this tabernacle has to do with a global significance it is to bring worship throughout the world this is the center of it but it has a global implication a global purpose and that purpose is to bring sanctification holiness So it begins there in this location, but it spreads out through the world. So we have these curtains, and they are made. Their their length are 28 cubits, and its width is 4 cubits. And one cubic, its measurement, is as all the curtains. So we have the same measurement for each of these 10, 10, curtains move now if you would to the the second part or let's move on to verse three we have five curtains shall be joined uh with one to another it uses the term isha el achota which means a woman to her sister but why do we have this expression well the word for curtain is in the feminine so we say one to another, but since it's feminine, we use the word one woman to another. So these curtains are being joined together, and it's going to be very specific how they're joined together. Look again at verse 3. Five curtains shall be joined one to another, and five curtains join one to another. So we have ten, but they're made in two different units each unit comprising of five curtains. Why five? Well, five, most would say, has to do with the number of incomplete. Now, the rabbis look at this and they say, this tabernacle worship, as we talked about last week, it is all a tavnit, it's all a pattern of of what was the real tabernacle, the real holy place, and where was that? in the heavens so we want to realize that that this worship at the tabernacle although there's a degree of fullness for us in that time period in the wilderness in that spiritual condition having received a physical redemption but not that spiritual redemption that only messiah can give all of this tells us that there's still something lacking, still something incomplete because, as I said, 
the real worship, the real pattern, the real holy place is in the heavens. Look now to verse 4. And you shall make lu leot, which is loops. Now, this is, we're told to join them, but how to join them? This is what we're speaking now. The things that are going to be used to join them so that they can be assembled properly. Verse 4. And you shall make loops, and these loops are made out of techelet, that, that turquoise or blue material. So you shall make, in the singular, speaking to, to Moses, he's responsible for this. You shall make loops of, of this blue or turquoise at the edge of each curtain, at the end. So it's at the edge of it, but also at the end. Now, realize what it's saying here. We're not talking about the top portion of the curtain, but most would understand this as the sides. And therefore, we put these loops and we put them on the edge, and then it tells us at the extremes, that is at the borders of these edges or the extreme sides that's where they're going to be joined together. So you make these loops of, of techelet upon the edge of one curtain, meaning each curtain, at the end. And at the end, you join them. Thus, you shall do to the edge of a curtain at the edge, at the end, at the extreme end, they shall be joined to the second one. So we can see how these things are being put together, assembled in a general way. But we're only told they're loops. How do you join loops to one another? Well, now it's going to tell us more. Look now, if you would, to verse 5. We're told here, and 50 loops you shall make with one curtain. So each curtain has 50 of these loops. You shall make 50 loops at the end of the curtain, which you shall join it to the second one. And this should be parallel. The loop should be parallel. Each one, here again, a woman to her sister, each one to another. So we make them, and each of the curtains have to be con constructed in the same way. So that these loops, which are 50 all together at the end, that they have to match up together. But we still don't know how to join them. Well, this is what we find out in verse 6. In verse 6 it says, And you shall make 50 hooks of gold. So it's with these hooks. Now, be aware that we're going to see two different words for hooks. And most of them, of the scholars say, the two different words, they're hooks, but it refers to either two different sizes or two different shapes, structures of the hooks. This will become clearer, at least the issue, not necessarily how to do it, but at least the matter will become discuss again later on. Here, though, we're only dealing with one type of hook. Look again at verse 6. And you shall make 50 hooks of gold, and you shall join a curtain, one to another, a woman to her sister, with these hooks. And it shall come about one tabernacle. So what do we have here? We have this instruction to make a tabernacle. We are called to make 10 curtains. These 10 curtains are specifically 28 cubics in length and four cubics in width. And we're told that these cubics are made, or excuse me, these curtains are made from three materials. They are techelet, which is a blue 
material, then a purple, and then a crimson or scarlet. And they are joined together with loops, 50 loops. 50, what should come into our mind is liberty, freedom. So worship has a degree of liberating us from the bondage, from the, the ways of the world in order to serve God. And these, these loops, we make them exactly at the edge, on the extreme ends of the edge, and we join them with hooks. And for every loop, there is a, uh, for every loop, there is a hook, and all of them, all of them have to be joined together in this way. And when we do this, we are making this tabernacle. Let's move on to verse 7. Now, there's the basic structure, but now we're going to come across another word, ohel. Ohel is the Hebrew word for tent. And this is going to type, kind of be a type of covering. Look at verse 7. And you shall make curtains of izim. We've come across this word before. It's goat hair. Izim are goat, but it's implied the hair of a goat. So you should make curtains of goats, goat's hair, for a tent over the tabernacle. So this is another layer for the tabernacle. Keep reading. Notice what it says. And these curtains, in the first layer, there were ten. But now there's going to be 11. And 11, once more, according to the, the sages, we get 11 usually by, by 10 and 1. And it speaks about one is God, as we said, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And so God is, what it's speaking here is unique. One can mean unique. Ten, completely, he's completely unique. Another way that we can talk about, about this number is with the number six and five. Five is incompletion. Six is grace. So it's grace that makes up for incompletion. So there's many things that you can do with these numbers. Many people don't like this type of study. Other people, they, they see great significance in it. But let's press on. Nevertheless, when we read, we find here, keep reading in our, our text, we find that there are 11 curtains of goat hair, and you shall make them, verse 8. Now, the dimensions of this second layer are somewhat different, and there's going to be great significance in that. The length of one curtain is 30 cubits, and the width is 4. So the same width, but the length is longer by two cubits. And we're going to see why that is in a moment and why there's an extra one. Look now to verse, verse 8, the second part. And one curtain, its measurement shall be one, and it's the same measurement for the 11 curtains, these outer layers. So we find that there's 11, and each of their measurements are the same for each. Verse 9. And you shall join five curtains alone and six curtains alone. So here in the previous one, we had five and five. But naturally here, we have five and six. And this is why when we look at 11, it's preferred the five and the six, rather than four and seven, eight and three, nine and two, any others. So we are giving insight in what's trying to be referred to the reader. Once more, verse nine. And you shall join five curtains alone and six curtains alone. And you shall, this is a word, multiply the six curtain. 
Now, when it says multiply, what it's probably referring to here is folding it over. Multiply times two, it's referring to here the word for folding. Now, it's a word for multiplying, but it has the intent of folding this six curtain. And it should be at the end of the tent, facing the end of this tent. Verse 10. And you shall make again the same way that uh, we saw that first layer of curtain. It was joined together by these loops and hooks. Same thing here. Look at verse, verse 10. And you shall make 50 loops at the edge of the curtain, of each curtain. And then it has the same word, at the extreme meaning. The curtain comes to an end. You put these loops on them, but at the extremes. So at the top and the bottom, in other words, of this curtain. And you should join it there with these 50 loops upon the edge of the curtain. You shall join it to the second one. So the same information, the same joining. Likewise, verse 11. How do you join these 50 loops together? Well, you need, as it says here, verse 11, and you shall make hooks, but this time it's hooks of, your Bible may say, bronze or, or, or copper. It's simply the word nechoshet in, in, in Hebrew. And some say it's copper, some say it's bronze. Nevertheless, verse 11. And you shall make hooks of copper or brass, 50 of them, and you shall bring these hooks into the loops, and you shall join the tent, and it shall become one. So when we join it all together through these hooks and the loops, it becomes one tent. That's what it's saying. Verse, verse 12. Now, notice there's going to be additional instead of 10 there's 11 instead of 28 there's 30 so there's going to be a, a overage and that's why when we look at verse 12 we had the word ve serach this is a dangling it refers to that which overlays something it extends so we read the odif Odef in modern Hebrew word is the word for change. When you pay for something and you, you pay with too much, you get change back. You get the remaining, the extra. And that's what it's talking about here. The extra basically shall hang over, the extra of the curtain should hang over the tent, uh, half on half of the curtain. Its extension should hang over at the back of the tabernacle. So what we find here is that half of it, notice what it says, and the extra part of the curtain of the tent shall hang over half of it, of the curtain shall, shall hang over at the end of the tabernacle. So this is referring to this half. And why half? Well, we folded it, correct? The 11th one. So it's half the size, and it folds over, it hangs over half of it. But what about these extra two? This half of that 11th one hangs over half of it on the back portion, but notice what it says in verse 13. And one cubic on one side, and one cubic on the other, for this is the additional part of the length of the curtain of the tent, and it shall be for a overhanging upon the sides of the tabernacle on each of the sides to cover it. So notice what it says. On this tent, which is covering the tabernacle, we find that, very important, we find that the 11th one is folded in half, and it's at the back portion for a, a overhang. Then we find on the sides, much smaller, 
it only has one cubic on each of the sides for an overhang. So what we clearly learn is that that first layer is completely covered by the tent or a covering for the tabernacle. Now look at verse 14. And you shall make a lid. Now even though this leaven curtain tent covers it, now we're speaking specifically about the top portion because it uses the word mixe. Mixe is the modern Hebrew word for a lid. So you shall make a lid for the tent. And this lid is going to be made of ram skin dyed red. And we find that its lid is also of a animal. We call it here techashim. But techashim, we don't know. Your Bible may say badger skins up above, meaning the top layer, the one that is exposed, are the second skins. Not the ram skins. They are underneath the, the skins of this unknown animal, but what many English Bibles call the badger skins. So now we have this structure for the tabernacle. But again, how do we assemble it? We have the materials, the curtains, and the tent. And all of this has to be assembled and stood up. Up until now, we couldn't do this. There's no support. So notice what it says, beginning in verse 15. And you shall make planks or boards for the tabernacle of acacia wood standing. So these planks are going to be stood up like pillars, so to speak, in order that the, the curtains and the tent can be placed upon them, assembled. And notice verse 16, these planks are 10 cubics is the length of a plank and a cubic and a half cubic is its width. So one and a half cubits is the width of each plank. Verse 17, Shte now this is a word for, and I realize that English Bibles gives it different words, but it is basically like a handle. It is that which extends from the plank in order that it can be placed into the ground. So we have here, notice what it says, two yadot, however your Bible translates it, for each of the planks. And then we have the word meshu lavot, which is to integrate. That is so that they can be brought together in a unique way and assembled. So that these two handles, they have to be integrated one to another for the purpose of, of and it says again, to join it together, each one to its sister, same expression. Thus you shall do for all the boards or the planks of the tabernacle. And you shall make these planks for the tabernacle, 20 boards for the southern side. So we know that uh, one of these curtains is going to be on the southern side. And each of these sides are going to have 40 sockets of silver. And this is going to be to assemble them, to hold the planks together together. And, and we can show you some pictures for how this is done. Verse 18, And you shall make for the boards of the tabernacle 20 of them for each side, for the southern side. Verse 19, And 40 sockets of silver you shall make for the 20 boards, two, two sockets for each plank. So that's why we have 20 planks. Each plank has two sockets, so 40 all together. 40 is a number for change. 
Worship brings change. And then we're told here that uh, for each of the two handles, there's also two of the sockets uh, for each aboard. So for two handles, two for two of the handles, there's two sockets for each of the boards. So two handles we have. Verse, verse 20. And the second side of the tabernacle, we talked about the southern side. This is for the side of the north. And there's also going to be the same thing, 20 planks. Verse 21. For these 20 plaques, there's going to be 40 sockets of silver, two sockets for each plank, and then we have two uh, sockets for each plank. Verse 22. When we get to verse 22, we're talking, it's a change of a word. No longer are we talking about the sides, but we're talking about the end. And this is the end, and it's for the western side. We've had the southern side, the northern side, and the southern, or the western side. Look at verse 22. And the, the another word for side, but it's a different word. And the side of the tabernacle on the west, you shall make six boards or planks. But look at verse 23. But two of the planks you shall make at the ends or at the corners of the tabernacle of the side. So on the two sides, we're going to have an extra plank given. And therefore, instead of six, so what they want you to do is put in six and then to the ones that are on the sides, the extremes, you add to that another board. That's what they're telling the person to do. Verse 24. And speaking about these planks, it says, and they shall be twins below, meaning they shall arrive in the same way. They shall be exact, similar to one another. That's why twins. And they shall be, to me, perfect meaning that they also at the top should come up in a similar way to match each other at the top. And there, there's going to be what's called tabaot, these rings, one ring. And this is going to join these two planks that form the end at that western side together. So it says, and thus there shall be two at the ends of this, this wall, this end. All together, look at verse 28. And there shall be eight planks, and there shall be uh, sockets of silver. How many? Well, for, for each plank, we put six, but then we add two to get eight. So you have eight planks at that western end in total. And we're going to have sockets of silver. How many? Middle of verse 25, 16 sockets. For two sockets for each board. So eight boards in total, each one two sockets. That's why we have two times eight, 16. Eight has to do with, with redemption. Eight has to do with, with something new. So verse 25, second part. There's going to be two sockets for each plank, verse 26. And you shall make, and this next word is the word brichim. Brichim are bars. And this is similar to what we saw in regard to the, the poles that we had in the table of showbread and also for the Ark of the Covenant. And what these are going to do, and what's interesting, in this sense, they're bars like, in fact, in Israel, we have a door company. And the name of the door company is related to this Hebrew word because when you lock the door, 
there's bars that go to the full distance of the door and into the mezuzot, into the doorpost to make it secure. And that's what it's doing with these bars. Verse 26, and you shall make bars of, of acacia wood. And it says five, two, for the planks of the side, one side of the mishkan, the tabernacle. So we're going to have five bars and they're going to go all the way through. There's going to be one at the top, one at the bottom, on the inside and on the outside, and then one within the plant that's in the midst of it that goes the whole way. So this is important because that's why we get five, two on the inside, two on the outside, and one in the midst of the plank. So it's absolutely secure. Look again at at verse verse 26 verse 27 and five bars for these planks for the side of the tabernacle the second side and five bars for the 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 planks of the the side of the tabernacle on the west so we have five on the southern side five on the northern side and five also on the western side that go the entire length verse 28 and there should be and this is what i've already alluded to there should be a bar in the midst now this is a middle bar so you have one at the top one at the bottom but the middle one is actually in the midst of the plank look again verse 28 and the bar in the middle is in the midst of the planks. And it joins from one end to the other. So this is important because it makes it secure in the middle. Verse 29. And the planks you shall cover with gold. And the rings you shall cover, you should make gold. And they are a house. They are basically what you put in for the bars. And you cover the bars with gold as well. So these rings are what's going to, on the outside, the top and the bottom, the inside and the out, they bar, those bars are going to be placed into rings just like we saw those same bars for the tabernacle, or excuse me, for the shulchan, the table of the showbread and for the Ark of the Covenant. But the inner one, in the midst of it, they don't need rings because they're going through the board directly and that will keep it. It does not need these uh, uh, rings for it. Verse 30. And you shall stand up the tabernacle according to its judgment, which... I have showed you, which you have been shown, God showed them, but it says which you have been shown on the mountain. Now, we have dealt with the, the structure from an exterior primarily. We know that there's an interior, and this is what he begins to speak about in the last few verses. Look at verse 31. And you shall make a parochet. A parochet is like a veil. We know, for example, in Matthew 27, I believe in verse 51, the veil, the parochet, when Messiah died upon that cross, released his spirit. It says that the veil of the, tabor, uh, the temple, meaning the holy place, what separates the holy place from the most holy place, it was torn from top to bottom. So this is the veil that we're speaking of. Look at verse 31. And the veil you shall make of, once more, techelet, this blue turquoise substance, argaman, this royal purple, and tolaat shani, which is crimson. And notice the word shesh mashzar is after the orders change. It should be twisted linen. 
you shall make of it how ma say choshev this cunning work this intelligent work and you shall do on it so also on the parochet there was these kruvin these cherubim these images of angels a unique angel verse 32 and you shall set it upon four pillars of acacia so this would be four pillars of acacia wood this is what the veil the parochet is is placed on these four pillars need to be must be covered with gold and now we have hooks but these are different hooks probably larger hooks that the veil is is attached to these these pillars with so these hooks larger ones different perhaps uh, uh, dimension and structure these ho hooks are going to be gold upon the four on the four sockets of silver so likewise these these pillars are going to have sockets of silver which you attach these hooks to when you would place upon it the parochet this veil verse 33 and you shall set the parochet this veil okay at the hooks so you set it upon the hooks and you shall bring it there from inside the parochet the ark of the covenant so you bring there to this place where the veil is you bring inside that's what it means the ark of the covenant and the parochet will make a distinction for you between the holy place and the holy of holies so we have let's get this right we have the tabernacle and it has a southern wall or southern side any northern side and also a backside on the west also dividing up the interior there's this veil this veil is placed upon four pillars of acacia wood covered over with gold they have sockets on the top with hooks and it's with these hooks that you're able to attach this veil to it and this veil makes a distinction just like it says here they have the law it makes a distinction between the holy place and the most holy place verse 34 and you shall set now we've talked about the ark of the covenant it's in the holy place the most holy place excuse me the ark of the covenant is on the most holy place in the most holy place and we find here that the ark of the covenant we learned two weeks ago it has a lid or a covering and it's called the kaporet look again at verse 34 and you shall set the kaporet the mercy seat upon the ark of the covenant in the holy of holies and you shall set the table this would be the table of the showbread outside the parochet so only the the ark of the covenant is at this time in the tabernacle only it is in the holy of holies you have on the outside of the parochet you have the table of showbread and also you have the menorah which is facing the table of the showbread and it is on the southern part of the the tabernacle while we have the the table of the showbread which is on the north so the menorah is on the southern part facing the tabernacle of show, or the table of showbread which is on the north verse 36 and you shall make a screen for the door of the tent and this screen is going to be comprised of not surprisingly tachelet that blue or turquoise that royal purple and crimson and it's also going to be of a twisted linen and it shall be work which is embroidery 
So it's different. It tells us something somewhat different about the screen. Our last verse, verse 37. And you shall make the screen five pillars of acacia wood. And you cover them, these five pillars, with gold. And notice that they also have these hooks. But this is a different word, the second word of hooks, meaning probably a bigger or a different uh, uh, structure. These are golden hooks. And it says here, you shall cast for them the five sockets of copper. So here on that screen, you have as well these five pillars of acacia wood. They're covered with gold. They have hooks upon them, but you're going to cast for them five sockets of, of copper or bronze. So this is the general structure for the tabernacle. We'll conclude with that. A lot of material needs to be reviewed, reread, and reread in order that we can learn more and more about this significant structure. Well, I'll stop now. Shalom from Israel.